All right, I won't reintroduce myself again, um, but uh, one additional hat I have, and it's a long one, uh, is I'm chair of the Vulcan System Integration Side Group, uh, recently renamed from WSI, which is Windows System Integration. This is the main thing we've been working on um, since the inception of the Vulcan. So today I'll be talking about uh, Swap Chain, which is the, uh, the meat of Vulcan WSI, and how you create them, and how they get used. So, let's get going. So, a bit of uh, uh, jargon busting to kick off with, uh, because I'll be using these terms throughout uh, the talk. Uh, platform, whenever I refer to a platform, I'm talking about an operating system, Windows system platform. Uh, so, Android, Windows, Wayland, etc. Uh, not a chip set or anything. The presentation engine is a term we use to describe uh, the, the platform compositor or the display engine used uh, in order to get things onto the display, onto the screen. And when I say application, I mean your app, your game engine, the thing above the API that's whatever that is, be it a fancy game engine or an app directly using Vulkan. So the great thing that uh, Windows System Integration and Vulkan brings is a uh, similar approach of explicit control to presentation that we do to graphics uh, and uh, other GPU job management. And it's designed, to, the whole process was designed to fit today's compositing window systems and, and actually look at how they, they what they need from the API uh, as we shaped it. Uh, not all extensions that form Vulcan WSI is supported by every platform. Um, you must check and enable, as Tom said in his talk, any extensions your application uses. So uh, make sure that they're, they're advertised and you'll discover some platforms, some extensions are not available. Uh, so today's presentation is the basics of actually getting, using all the stuff you've heard so far, now you want to hit the screen, uh, what do you need to do to get there? So how many WSI extensions are there? 10. Uh, I'm not going to go through each one in, in very detail, you'd be glad to hear. Uh, the two cross-platform instance extensions, so that, that's where Tom described in the loader an extension existing. Uh, the surface extension, which introduces the VK surface object, uh, and the display extension, which is about display management, uh, which I'll explain later. Then there's, there's uh, six platform uh, instance extensions which they basically hook up your platform native types to the Vulkan surface. They're, they're, they're all fairly light, um, not for, for very um, obvious reasons. And there's two cross-platform device extensions. Uh, the Swapting extension, which is the bulk of uh, WSI's uh, meat, and the display swap chain, which extends the Swapting extension for going direct to display. Um, Vulcan surfaces are firstly not an equivalent of an EGL surface. So they both in, uh, take you on your route between your window um, to your buffer or your image that you, you're, you're rendering to. But unlike an EGL surface, uh, when you create a Vulcan surface, all it does is encapsulate the native type of the platform. It doesn't go off and start creating buffers or anything like that. That's for later, we'll get there in a second. Um, the reason we created the Vulkan surface object is to be able to create platform independent queries. So once you've abstracted your platform specific uh, native window handle or native surface handle into a Vulkan surface handle, you can then figure out what format is it, what usage um, will the image that I create from it have, um, what, what transform is it currently in, and can it support other transforms, uh, all done in a platform independent way. Additionally to that, there are also some platform specific queries, uh, so, so that we, we haven't tried to abstract everything across all platforms. We've realized some things are unique to a specific platform. Now, the key thing is uh, presentation support is, de is dependent on a, on a queue family. So each queue family, and I've, just, I've got um, like three examples 
physical devices. Uh, you can have multiple cube families in, in a physical device. Each one may or may not support presentation and, and it may or may not support presentation to a specific platform. So physical device C in this diagram, there's no presentation. So that could be like a, a computer only uh, involved in implementation. You can't actually get to the screen. Whereas physical device A has a Q family that can actually uh, hit two platforms. It, and this is an example in the Linux world when you have both Wayland and X living alongside each other on the same uh, um, implementation. You can have one Vulkan device that actually can support both. So, swap chain, the <coughs> week I was talking about. Uh, in essence, a swap chain is an array of presentable images. Uh, a presentable image is a, uh, a Vulkan image, a VK image, but the one, one that you obtain from a swap chain. The application gets to request the minimum number of presentable images. So if you want to be double buffered, triple buffered, or have additional ones for your, your, the way your engine works, you can request it. And the implementation creates at least that number subject to a limit. So uh, the memory limits, if you, if you, my recommendation, if you're thinking, if you're presenting WQHD, don't, don't allocate seven depth swap chains until you're going to run out of memory. So be sensible about how you use it, but it gives you that flexibility uh, and choice on, 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 on patterns that can support it. Um, the cool thing about how swap chains are designed is that the presentable images are allocated up front, so avoiding hitches last minute during your frame loop, and allowing, um, as uh, Michael described earlier, command buffered content being pre-recorded to fit a specific um, swap chain uh, image. So, so you have multiple command buffers to target uh, each one of your images in your swap chain, but you can pre-record them in advance. Uh, there's several present modes that we've designed. FIFO is mandatory everywhere. And uh, for those of you that love ETL, woo, yay, as long as that's what you want. Um, FIFO is like swap interval one, um, whereas we, we finally kind of realized that we disagree what swap interval zero means on different platforms. So we've divorced the, the meaning of swap interval into a couple. There's a mailbox mode which Basically, it means I'll use the latest image, uh, but no tearing. And an immediate mode, which is go straight on to um, read whatever I've sent to you, and you may end up with some tearing. Uh, so that, that's what we've got. And there's also another mode, which is like swap control tear, uh, five for relaxed. Um, uh, look into the extension for that explanation. It's a bit more cumbersome. Um, so swap chains. Are good. Uh, this is a, th this joke doesn't work as well here in, in our esteemed British audience. It's mainly targeted at Tom in the back that calls everything awesome when when he receives an email that's awesome. I say these are good, which to Americans means awesome. Uh, uh, it, it, Swap chains are very well designed uh, in terms of how applications need them, and we've had very good feedback overall about how they've been designed. Um, a key thing that we've done is you know which image in, in, within the swap chain you'll be presenting, and the content of that image is preserved from the previous content you put on it. So uh, it's similar, but not exactly the same as how buffer range and partial update have done it in EGL, but it, it's done in a way that you don't have to um, query to find out the age of the, the, the image you've obtained. You know it because you're about to send that image in, and you know how old it is. The application is also responsible for recreating swap chains. So no, no surprises, uh, uh, no, no, no surprises at all. Um, sorry, uh, uh, a joke. Um, uh, the, this is different again from how EGL does things. Uh, so in EGL, the platform, uh, after you call swap buffers, can say, oh, by the way, your service has changed size, just to let you know. Um, after the fact and does scaling or um, um, cropping to deal with it. In Vulkan, you, the application, are responsible for dealing with that. You, you will be notified, and I'll go through how that's done in a second. 
um, but you need to recreate your swap chain or you need to deal with that if, if a resize occurs. It doesn't just happen um, magically uh, and then lead to some painful orientation uh, um, changes and resize behavior. Swap chains are jolly good, which means super awesome. Um, they, the presenting and acquiring uh, operations are separate, as Tobias alluded to in his talk. Uh, so there's no need to submit uh, a new image just to acquire the next one you want to work on, depending on what the presentation engine is up to. So I have to add that proviso that if the presentation engine is hogging uh, the images, it may say, actually, you need to release one, you need to submit one into the presentation engine in order for another one to be free. So it, there are limits to this, but uh, the, the implementation with, we're, we're, we're seeing and most platforms will be able to give you that flexibility that you can acquire separately from presenting. Uh, and that's again contrasting with how EGL swap buffers works, which is you, you did, when you call swap buffers, you are both presenting and acquiring at the same time, and that's, that's one operation. And we, we wanted that to be divorced because to avoid stalls in your framework because they're very bad. Very bad. Gone. Um, and the, the other uh, key point is about ownership. So the presentation um, engine must only display the images that it has been given. Uh, when we get to front buffer rendering, eventually we'll see what happens there. Um, that will be a bit more exciting. So the steps to get your presentable images. <coughs> so first off, you use your pattern-specific code uh, to create your native window, native service, whatnot. Uh, you create a Vulkan service from it. You query information using the, the, the platform uh, independent queries to figure out what your service can do. You create a swap chain using the, that information, and from that you obtain your presentable images. And what I'll show you here is how that's divided between the extensions and the platform. So platform specific, that's left to Android, Windows, uh, uh, Linux, uh, and then you've got the, the, the three extensions, so you use the platform um, instance extension, the service instance extension, and the swap chain device extension. So that's how things are split up. So it's as easy as one, two, three. It is actually f fairly um, straightforward. Um, I am glossing over the stuff that Tobias showed. I'm glad he showed it. Uh, the, the key things that I'm not showing is, is how the synchronization works. That, that is the absolute key. If you look um, at the example he provided uh, between the present and acquire. So acquire gives you a semaphore that you could then use to make sure has an acquire actually happened, and so then when you present, you present it to your queue. So you must make sure that that, that synchronization happens. But the, the, this, this, the, the black arrows here represent the steady state of your frame loop. So once you've created your swap chain, those are the three steps you go through um, every frame. So these lovely red arrows explain what happens when an event occurs that you need to deal with. So that's uh, there the are two types of uh, events, uh, so er errors that could come up uh, when you do an acquire, when you do a present. The, the, one is um, telling you your swap chain is suboptimal. And what that means is that your swap chain can still be used, you can still continue, but you may wish to recreate it because you can get some performance benefit. So let's say you're being scaled up and the scaling isn't optimal. If you recreated it, you could improve your performance. Uh, service loss is the, uh, it's gone. <laughs> Don't try to present me anymore with this swap chain. Uh, you need to recreate it because either um, you disconnected the thing that you're presenting to or uh, the size is not compatible and you can't scale it. So that means you, you, you must uh, start with a new swap chain. Uh, but the, there's a nice mechanism to create a new swap chain from your old swap chain and the transition um, should be clean. And all of this belongs in the VKHR swap chain extension. So on to Vulkan displays. Uh, so this is uh, the mechanism to discover what displays are connected to your, uh, to 
your Vulkan device outside of a Windows <coughs> And a reminder that not all platforms support this. Uh, so this, is, this isn't supported on Android, for example, uh, at the moment. Uh, may, may not be. It's a choice of whether this is desirable or not. So some platforms, they you say you must go through the Windows system. Uh, that doesn't mean that the, 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 an additional composition step happens every time. The compositor can be intelligent to know actually you're full screen. I, I can bypass composition, but uh, again, it's not available on all, on all platforms. So the VKKHR display extension defines these two objects called uh, the display and the display mode, and, uh, as well as the display plane. So, uh, no, the display plane is not an object, sorry, it's a structure. Um, and effectively, this shows the relationship between them. So a physical device will tell you what displays it can support um, and what combination of display modes and display planes can be used to create a Vulkan surface. Uh, and the additional thing that you can do is that there's also ways to, custom, to create custom display modes for displays that can support it. So different resolutions and, and different color mode settings. And what you get to eventually is creating the Vulkan service we talked to earlier from a display plane, the represented display plane, sorry. And just again, a bit of clarity, a Vulkan display represents an actual display Whereas an EDL display is just a namespace representing a driver that's not a display. So, yes. <laughs> Hope that's clear. <laughs> okay. Ah, yeah. um, so, finally, in our set of extensions is the display swap chain extension. So, this is the bolt on to the swap chain extension that provides a couple of things. Uh, it, adds the ability uh, to provide additional information when you're doing the queue present, when you're submitting to your, your queue, um, your presentable images. If you want a particular region within a, your swap chain image, a particular region on your display to be targeted, um, as well as whether the, the, this notion of displays that can support persistent images, uh, whether that's supported or not. And then it adds the ability to create this thing called a shared swap chain. And this is a structure that can take um, multiple uh, swap chains at the same time. Uh, so it's, it's an additional function that instead of submitting to one swap chain, you submit to multiple swap chains that can target separate displays. Uh, at the moment, it doesn't uh, guarantee atomicity, i.e. you don't know that it's gonna hit the displays at exactly the same time, but that's something that uh, may be exposed in the future. Okay, so that's the overview. Um, hoping I'm sticking to time. Any questions? Anyone with the mic? Um, so, uh, thank you for the talk. What about cases where you want to share your swap chain between applications, such as in the Rift SDK? Between applications. So like in the Rift SDK, where you talk to the, the VR server to get break buses to render into, and you render into them in your application, and then it is its own little presentation layer. So, so you've got your, you describe the setup, you've got the two, so you talk to the VR server, yeah. and it's basically a compositor inside an application rather than inside the Windows system. So it composites the framework that you give it, and then presents okay. it on the Rift display. So I think it depends how, how it exposes that. So I think one, one option is that um, it basically can do that as a layer, that it basically uh, intercepts those commands before giving it to the actual platform underneath. That's one, one way you could have that set up. Uh, there are no, I mean, the, the, the way that like, things are set up in Android, for example, is that the, the loader actually acts as a Windows system integration implementation and uh, has a, under the hood presentable images that are really just normal Vulkan images in each driver, and it basically does all the, the 
hooking up with, with services over there. I think you could do a similar thing with uh, how like, um, Oculus SDK or others, but it's something that you need to look at in more detail. We could ask them. Huh? They're in the working group. We should ask them. Yeah. Exactly an interesting question. Thank you. Um, one thing about this, uh, on this topic of images, how do you actually provide synchronized with the PC? So at the moment when you um, call QPresent, uh, that doesn't in any way give you a timing guarantee from the, from the presentation engine. So all that says is when QPresent returns on that queue, so the unbox that queue means the, the, the GPU bit has handed it over but you don't know at what point the, the presentation engine will display will pick it up. It'll be up to it to know. Uh, so it, in FICO mode, uh, it basically waits until the next one is done before picking that up. Uh, there are questions about, uh, uh, we've had requests about looking at how we do uh, timing of presentation. At the moment, it's effectively hidden like it is with EGIL, um, uh, EGIL swap buffers where you know, you've sent it off, but you don't know when it's going to be picked up. Okay. In which case, uh, thank you very much. I'll now hand over to Chris. Um, so Chris is going to talk about the exciting stuff happening in compute in Vulkan uh, and what future things it enables. Thank you. Thank you.